And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him, and they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Because, man, if somebody is able to heal, why wouldn't all of us seek him out, right? Everyone is looking for you. Verse 38, and he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus, thank you for this passage. God, I pray that as we look at this, that we would come with open hands, ready for hard truths and ready for rejoicing and seeking you out for our healing and for our well-being. Lord, I pray that both of those would be true this morning in your name. Amen. So the first thing that I want you to see from this passage is number one, that Jesus is the source of our physical and emotional healing. He is the source because he has authority over our well-being. You see, Peter's mother had a fever and she was sick. Anybody been sick? Anybody been around somebody who was sick? It's kind of part of the human condition, isn't it? Some of you are watching online because you are sick, right? And so sickness is a reality of the human condition. See, Peter's mother got sick. And the cool part is I've stood Peter's house. Actually, we believe we know where it's at today. And I've stood where this house is today. It's right down the street from the temple in the city. But a couple of things I want you to see. To Jesus during his ministry, sickness was a mild inconvenience. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. Brothers and sisters, there's a precedent for us. And I'm, I'm going to start with this truth, but remember, I'm going I'm to bring it back around. It is important that... They brought her to him. Brothers and sisters, when we get sick and we have people sick in our lives, who should we go to? To Christ. Desperately on our knees and praying, yes, we should run to the Lord because he has the authority over our well-being. The first thing we need to see is they told Jesus about her condition. We need to be people that are about prayer for the sick. We need to be praying for the sick. By the way, this is a great opportunity for us. We as a church have a prayer chain. And if you're not on that prayer chain, um, would you contact me or get with Emily Runs, our, our prayer chain. And that's where we pray for one another. We lift one another up when we're sick, when we're in need, when things are happening. We're praying for one another because we're a people who prays. Amen? Because we know who has the authority over our well-being. We run to the one who has power. We run to Christ. We run to Christ. And we also need to be about bringing the sick to Jesus. And so we're going to see this played out even more in a passage down the line. But there's this idea that believers are about pointing people, those that are sick, to Jesus. And his sickness is not just physical sickness, is it? There's a lot of us that struggle with emotional sickness, with mental illness. This is a thing. And in all of those things, who has the authority over our well-being? Jesus. And so we need to be people that advocate for people to come in prayer and come to Christ. By the way, as I, as I say this, please hear me say, when I remember back, Ashley had some really bad counsel. Somebody came to her and said that she should just pray and that she should never go see a doctor. That's garbage advice. Okay? You can do both, and you should do both. You seek out the Lord because sometimes the Lord works through the doctors and works through the medical um, professionals. And so if you're here, 
Please don't hear, just go to Jesus and then ignore the possibilities that Jesus gives you for healing. Okay? I want to take you to a passage, James 5, 13 through 16. I want to take you, if you got your Bibles, turn to the book of James, James 5. James 5, verses 13 through 16. Here's where we get for the church some instruction on what it looks like to be people who pray for the sick. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Amen. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith. I want you to, if you've got a Bible, if you're an underliner, underline this word, will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will, and I continue to underline, will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be, everybody say it with me, healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I want you to see here, it almost at a glance seems like this passage is promising that if we just pray that somebody will get healed. But did you see here that word, save? That's literally the word sozo. Sozo, you know where else the word sozo, what that means? It means salvation. It means salvation. So when we pray for the sick, when we pray for the sick, ultimately the prayer of faith will, will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. That, that term raise him up, if you look at the, the, the Greek in there, raise him up means either to wake him up or to bring him up. It also means pass away. It also means pass away. It also means to die. It can be used as that. So it can have one of those two meanings. So when we pray for one another for healing, sometimes that healing comes not how we expect it. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes that healing comes because the, the prayer will save Sozo, the one who is sick, because the higher priority for the believer is not that just everybody would get well so that everybody would get right with God. Because there is no more important healing than being made right with the creator of the universe. That is the healing, the eternal healing that God seeks out for us. We learned last week that the enemy, Satan, he will give us a very comfortable life if it means we very much ignore Jesus. But Jesus, you have to know, sometimes doesn't give us the comfortable life because he knows our eternity is more valuable. And there's this thing about humans. When we get everything we want, what do we do? History, read the Old Testament. When we get everything we want, we want more, and then we turn away from God, don't we? God understands this about our sin condition. God's ultimate goal for us is salvation and healing, and you see that in this passage. See, many begin to come to Jesus. Many come to Christ, and many become, many start to get healed, many demons start to get cast out. So we need to see that Jesus is really the center of the source of, of healing that we can have. He can heal us, and he does. There are instances, brothers and sisters, where he answers that prayer. By the way, as you know, when we ask God hard things, he has one of three answers. But you guys know this. Sometimes he says, yes, amen. Sometimes he says, no. And sometimes he says, not yet. Those last two are the hardest to hear, aren't they? But do we trust the God who has something higher in mind? See, when, when I was in college, my brother got diagnosed with a radical form of cancer. It was called rhabdomyosarcoma. And my brother was 16 when he was diagnosed with this. And it was very, very serious. 
and it scared my family. My mom at that time was the rock of our faith as a family. She's the reason I came to church. I think I've shared with you that I'm the product of her praying for me. I remember one night as I walked up the stairs seeing my mom after my brother's diagnosis, and, and I, I remember her sitting at, at the, the counter, and I remember her saying, Shane, I don't know why I pray. She was so discouraged. I don't know why I pray because God's going to do what he's going to do. You ever been there? Have you ever been there? Some of us, man, have been there. But years later, my brother gets treatment for cancer. He's now a lawyer in Denver. Pray for him even more. But we found out that God used my brother's cancer to bring my, my dad low to a place where my dad, for the first time in life, understood what true need of Jesus was. Two years ago, I got to baptize my dad. I'm firmly convinced that God used my brother's cancer to lead my dad to a depth of faith he would not have had. Sometimes God uses difficulty, and sometimes he says yes, other times he says no. It always makes me think of Peter when he's talking to Jesus, and uh, Jesus is telling him in the way that Peter is going to die. You remember this conversation? And Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, you're going to die in a really painful way. And what does Peter do? He's like, what about John? <laughs> you know, that's so us, isn't it? God, I want what I want. What about that guy? And Peter says, I have for John what I have for John, right? Essentially, these are Shane's summary notes. And for us, we need to understand that God has a purpose in our suffering and in our sickness. And for, Peter, or for Peter's mom in this moment, it was to display Jesus' power and his authority over sickness. That was why she was healed in this moment. But it doesn't always happen that way. But you need to understand that Jesus displays incredible compassion for the crowds, doesn't he? And if they're around him, he healed the sick with various diseases. But you need to see the second part of this passage shouldn't be disconnected. Because when he went away to pray very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were searching for him, what did they come and they ask? said, everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Everyone is looking for you. And it's like Jesus doesn't even acknowledge that phrase, right? Everyone's looking for you, Jesus. Everyone's looking for you. Everybody wants healing. Everybody wants demons cast out. Who wouldn't want that? He says, let us go to the next towns. Sometimes Jesus' answer to the crowds were, I didn't come for healing, I came. The healing is an aspect or it's a tool so that the more important healing can happen across the globe. You guys know what that is. That's called salvation. Jesus' ultimate mission was the salvation of the world. It's really important for us, brothers and sisters, to remember that Jesus has a higher purpose for us, more than just physical healing. There's a caution for us today. There is a sickness in Christianity today that says that you should just get everything you want from God. They call it the health and wealth gospel, that, that you just say the right things, you pray the right prayer. If you give the right money, God's gonna give you whatever you want. That is a lie. That is a lie, and it's not what the Bible teaches, and it's not why Jesus came. He isn't some big Santa Claus that's coming to give us everything that we want. He has something so much more important. The man that handed, uh, so at one time in a church that I served at, there was a man, we had a, a young lady, a young woman that had cancer, and it was obvious that it was going to take her life, and I remember this man, he handed her a flyer that said if she just prayed this right prayer, she would be healed. This man handed her a flyer that said that if you have this type of cancer, this is the sin that you have in your life. That's awful. That is straight up demonic. But that is infiltrating the church, isn't it? 
And it comes with incredible condemnation. And I remember as we prayed for this woman's healing, she, by the way, at the end of her life, her name was Kayleen, she baptized another young lady who she led to the Lord. She didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes God's answer is no, because he has a higher purpose. The gospel is the higher purpose. And so we see when Jesus responds to the disciples, he's showing them that his purpose is not just to heal everyone from their physical illness, but from their spiritual separation from God. See, God is different. See, pagans oftentimes will treat, throughout history, pagans have treated their gods as a means to an end. They did that with the Baals, if you remember, in the Old Testament. You guys remember in the Old Testament, in Judges in particular, the nation of Israel, they worshiped Yahweh, but then they went to the Baals and they began to worship the Baals. Why? Because they wanted good crops. And so they started to do worship Yahweh, and they, it's called syncretism when you worship Yahweh, God of the Bible, but you also worship and try to do other things and worship other gods so that you can get what you want. See, this is how pagans treat their gods. God does not want to be treated like some kind of idol, some kind of thing that we just get. It's easy to accidentally try to use God to just get what we want. But brothers and sisters, I want to caution you about this treatment of God. When we treat God this way, it leads to disappointment, or it leads to one of four things. Let me, let me go through a list with you. It leads to one of four things. When you treat God like uh, eternal Santa Claus, that he's just something there to get what you want, it will lead to disappointment and bitterness when you don't get what you want. And you will be disappointed in God because he didn't give you what you want. By the way, he didn't promise to make you rich, to make you healthy the rest of your days. But many people are given that promise. Ashley, somebody had promised that to Ashley, and so she walked away in shame. And so that's the number two end result of treating God like that is you walk away with condemnation because then you begin to ask, what have I done wrong? You begin to ask, have I not prayed the right prayer? Do I not have enough faith? And you begin to, to pour out that condemnation, that shame on yourself, and that is not right. You begin to say things like, I deserve this, or God's not listening to me because I'm doing something wrong. Did you know the whole book of Job was written to make sure that they, we know that's not true of God? The whole book of Job, Job had all of these people giving him horrible counsel, the whole book. The whole book is to show us the Job wasn't being punished because he was a bad guy or because he wasn't doing enough or he wasn't giving enough or he wasn't good enough or he didn't have enough faith. God had a higher purpose. And do you remember how the book of Job ends? Job asks God and begins to question God, and what does God say? It really doesn't give him an answer. It's a frustrating book, isn't it? Job ends with, where were you? God answers Job's plea with, where were you when I created all of creation? Where were you? What's God's point in the book of Job? He's doing things far above and beyond we could fathom or think or understand. Do we trust the God of the universe, even if it means hardship for us? So if you're here today and you feel condemnation or shame, because you haven't been healed, let that pass from you. That is not of our God. The other thing that happens, so we have disappointment, we have shame. The other thing, when you treat God like that, you become it, it really essentially it's idolatry because what you really want to worship is health and wellness and being okay and getting what you want. It's about using God to get what you want. That is, brothers and sisters, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. When we treat God and we worship God only when he gives us the things that we want, why are people in America leaving the church in droves? Because they're not getting what they want. We created a generation of consumers. 
I get the music that I want. I get the programs that I want. I get the counseling that I want. I get the church needs to tell me exactly what I want to hear. And if it doesn't, I'm out. Brothers and sisters, that's not worship of God. That's worship of things. You just want God to serve your things. We're guilty of that sometimes, aren't we? That's idolatry. And the, the, the fourth thing, and hopefully this is what we can turn our hearts to, is if God says yes, no, or not yet, we can trust and be thankful and worship anyway. We can trust and know that God is doing something that we don't understand. This is where Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things, in a lot and in a little. In physical healing, I can be thankful, Lord, but I can also be thankful when I'm sick. I can be thankful in when you tell me no because I know that you got something better for me. In healing and in sickness. By the way, when we get married, what is the typical saying? In sickness and in health, right? Because we understand this aspect of a relationship, don't we? Very few people view marriage as like that, but when we talk about marriage, we understand the importance that in sickness and health, it has to be above and beyond sickness and health, our relationship with our spouses. Our relationship with God has to be so much, even much more higher. We get this principle, don't we? Human beings understand the importance of not just using God or not just using people for what they have. And so... When we are in a trust relationship with Jesus, we trust what he wants. And so when he responds, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. We say, yes, Lord, even though I'm not the priority here. See, I think many of us tend to think of ourselves as the main character in the story of all life, don't we? Everybody should say amen to that, right? You're the hero of your story in our minds, and that's what we're told to believe, but you need to understand Jesus is the centerpiece of all history. And this all of creation, this story of all of humanity from start to finish, Jesus is the main character, we're not. And so when we look at the arc of all of history, we need to understand that we play a small part. We're not the highest priority Jesus is the centerpiece of all history. That hurts, doesn't it? Is that hard? Any self-entitled people here like, oh man, that kind of hurts, pastor. When we're in a trust relationship with Jesus, we trust what he wants. And he clearly shows us that the gospel being preached and people being eternally healed is his highest priority. He went all the way to the cross. Did he heal people? Yes. Did he heal everybody? No. Because his ultimate purpose was to go to the cross and pay the price for humanity's sin. Another story in the Bible is a man named Lazarus. Anybody heard of Lazarus? Anybody seen Lazarus lately? That's because even though Lazarus was raised from the grave, he died again. Well, that's a bummer. You're like, Jesus, you raised me up. That's awesome. And, you know, I'm still going to get old and I'm still going to pass away because that's what human beings do. Lazarus still died. And physical healing is only temporary. God wants to give you so much more than just something that's temporary. He wants to work towards giving you something that's eternal. And he did through salvation, his righteousness that he gives to the believer. See, God's concern about our eternal healing, the healing of our relationship with him. We often spend more time praying. Here's a quotable, tweetable thing. I heard this. It's not original to me. I don't know where I got it. We often spend more time praying to keep people out of heaven than to put people in it. Think about that. How many times have you prayed for travel mercies? <laughs> right? We often spend more time praying to keep people out of heaven than pe people into it. We are not the main character, and, and I talked about this 
And by the way, how do we know that Jesus is the main character? Have you ever read the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5? Revelation chapter 5, this beautiful picture, right? God's plan for all of creation is about to be unveiled. And John, he hears the angels begin to say, who is worthy to open the scroll? Who could, why we can't fathom who would be worthy to do this? And who steps up? The Lamb of God. Jesus Christ himself, he is the centerpiece. He's the hero of history. We are not. He's the main character and he is the only one who can unravel the scroll of God's redemption plan throughout all history. He is the king who has authority over our well-being. Oh, thank you, Lord, that it's not about me. If it was up to me to save me, I'd be in peril. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that you're also in good company when you begin to realize this. See, Paul was told when it came to healing, he said, I prayed and asked God three times for this thorn in my flesh to be removed. And what did God tell Paul? I'll tell you, my grace is sufficient for you means no. He said, my grace, grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, he got told no. Paul got told no for his healing. He said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may be resting upon me. I will boast all the more gladly that's incredible that Paul would say that to God when he heard the word no to his request. So my conclusion for us, brothers and sisters, today, when we cry out to God, why didn't you do it the way that I wanted you to? You could, and I know you can. He answers the same way he did Job. Where were you when I created all things? Brothers and sisters, so what does this mean for you? Would you run to Jesus when you're in need of healing? He is the place that we run to, either for healing or for comfort when he says no. And for trust, to know that our suffering matters. Because the world doesn't understand that, right? Our sickness, our suffering, cancer, if you've ever had that, right, or if you've been around a loved one, they need to know that that matters, that it's not suffering for nothing, but it's suffering for something. A believer never suffers for nothing. It always matters. So run to Christ when you're in need of healing. And brothers and sisters, this is one of the hardest things. We will all wrestle with this. I wrestle with this. Will you trust his answer if it's no or not yet? Will you trust his answer See, the Lord does everything that, uh, and I, I've heard this, and I just think it's a great way to, I don't know if it's necessarily, I mean, you're not going to find this in Scripture, but I think it, it illustrates the truth. The Lord does everything that you would, if you knew everything that he knew. The Lord does everything that you would, if you knew everything that he knew. We must trust we don't have the full picture. So brothers and sisters, if you're life group leader in your life groups this next week, would you ask the question, where in your life do you need healing? Do we all need healing? Yes. We live in a broken world. And then the second question, brothers and sisters, in your life groups, would you ask the question, has God ever said no? And how have you responded? Has God ever said no? And how have you responded? We're going to go into a time of response. But I want you to bow your heads and maybe just spend a minute thinking and, and cogitating on what is the Lord saying to you now? Have you run from him because he said no? Do you have a hard time trusting in him through those hardships? And it's okay to struggle. Some of you have tried to be your own healer and you need to repent and run towards God. 
And so with that, I'm going to play this song. Would you just spend a minute worshiping, contemplating, pondering what it is that God is saying to you through this message today? You're all I need. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be with us in the wrestling. God, in the wrestling, in the sickness, in the brokenness. God, there are some here that need your comfort, that need your healing. There's some here, God, that are not saved. God, that don't know you, haven't been made right with you, God. I pray now for their salvation, God. I pray that today would be the day. Today would be the day of their salvation. And for the believer here, God, I pray that they would be encouraged, that condemnation would melt away, God, that shame would melt away, and that, God, in their place, it would be a place of worship and thankfulness for the good and for the bad, God, for the the hard times and for for the easy times. God, we trust you. We trust you. We pray that in your name. Amen.